Hey guys, so I'd like to talk a little bit today about how bones develop and kind of the process in which the body controls um, the levels of calcium in um, the blood. So basically, bones develop in two different ways, and they're different based on whether you're talking about a long bone or a flat bone. So in long bones, like the humerus and the femur, um, a process called endochondral ossification occurs. And the gist of this is basically you're talking about a, um, uh, a template that is formed first, and that template's made of uh, cartilage, hyaline cartilage. So um, this is going to occur before birth in the fetus. So uh, a template of hyaline cartilage occurs early in fetal development within the first couple of weeks. And um, these templates look just like the bones, just smaller versions of the bones, and they're made purely of hyaline cartilage. And if you remember, hyaline cartilage just consists of collagen and water and chondrocytes. Those are the, the cells that actually secrete this, this uh, cartilage tissue. So um, they don't contain any blood vessels, so because of that, they have to remain really small so that they can get their nutrients by diffusion from the surrounding tissues. So you have this template of um, hyaline cartilage, which forms kind of a model of what the bones will uh, later be. And around the third or fourth month of fetal development before birth, these uh, hyaline templates of bone start to ossify and turn into the bone that we're more familiar with. The first thing that happens is that you'll have a primary ossification center. And this is going to occur right in the diaphysis, so right in the shaft of this hyaline cartilage template. And what will happen is those chondrocytes that are located, those living cells that secreted the collagen, or the cartilage and the collagen, they will enlarge, they'll calcify, and they'll die. And this um, creates room for osteoblasts to move in and start secreting uh, true bone tissue. So right in the middle of the shaft of the long bones, that's where you'll get the first kind of section of this, this true bone tissue. Okay. The second thing that will happen is that you'll get a bone collar that forms. This occurs a little bit later um, in fetal development. So here you'll have osteoblasts that lay down this like sheath of bone tissue around the diaphysis of the hyaline cartilage model. So it's almost like this little sheath of hardened bone tissue that um, starts to form around the outside of the, um, of the long bone. Okay. And while that's occurring on the inside of the bone, you've got osteoclasts that are starting to eat away some of the bone tissue that's just formed. And this is going to start making that medullary cavity of the long bone, which is going to eventually start to get larger and larger within that, that shaft of the long bone. Okay, so this is going to continue to, to, to occur, that bone collar gets a little bit more pronounced, and eventually the bone collar is going to merge with that primary ossification center, which is located right in the shaft of the, the long bone. The secondary ossification center, those are going to occur in the epiphysis. So um, this occurs uh, later in a development, typically after birth, and this is the start of the epiphyseal plate, which is responsible for the, the longitudinal growth in bone, which we had talked about a little earlier. This epiphyseal plate is going to continue to uh, produce um, new bone tissue that allows the bone to grow in length um, for, the, you know, basically a person's entire um, childhood and early adulthood. Um, the epiphyseal plate is going to continue to produce um, increased bone length for males up until the age of 21 or 2 and females a little bit. Um, you know, it, 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 it's going to allow the bone to grow up until the age of about 18 to 19 or 20. Okay. Finally, by the early 20s, the bones have completely ossified and so all of the cartilage has been replaced with um, bone tissue and no more growth occurs. And really you're just looking at uh, bone remodeling which is going to continue to happen throughout a person's life just to keep that bone uh, tissue nice and strong and new and fresh. The other type of bone development that occurs is called intramembranous ossification. This is going to occur only in flat bones, like our scapula and our, uh, the flat bones of our skull. In this case, you don't have this cartilage model, but what you'll have is you'll have this group of osteoblasts that are located very close together, and these guys will start secreting all of that bone tissue. They'll start secreting, you know, all that collagen, all those calcium phosphate crystals, you know, that creates um, 
osteoid, which is just another name for bone tissue. And this is gonna cause this these osteoblasts to kind of spread out as they secrete more and more of this bone tissue. Some of these osteoblasts are gonna get trapped in the bone tissue that they've secreted. Once that happens, those guys turn into mature bone cells called osteocytes, okay? And they change shape, so they have their little appendages that are kind of stretched through the bone tissue, which allows them to monitor the stresses that are occurring nearby. Um, this is gonna continue to happen until the flat bone is fully formed. So it's a slow process that kind of starts from a very small kind of group of cells that are um, secreting these bone tissues, okay? Now, um, this intramembranous ossification, like endochondral ossification, is not complete at birth. And this, an example of this is the soft spot that occurs in the top of baby's heads. That's simply because those flat bones have not fully developed to produce that um, hard bone tissue. So um, that's kind of how these bone, um, different types of bones develop. Now I want to talk a little bit about how the body regulates the amount of calcium that's in our blood. So bones obviously need calcium and that's, you know, they use calcium to make these calcium phosphate crystals that gives bone its hardness. But some other processes in the body require calcium, and those processes are really important. An example would be muscle contraction. We'll learn later that in order for muscles to contract, a lot of calcium needs to be located in the muscle tissues. So the kind of release of calcium causes muscle contraction. Without enough calcium, muscles aren't going to contract. The same thing happens with neurons. Neurons are cells of the nervous system that allow us to send signals associated with the nervous system. And without enough calcium in our body tissues, nerves can't communicate with each other. So if the amount of calcium in our blood starts to drop, that's going to be big problems for not only our muscle cells, but for our nerve tissues. We don't have enough calcium, our muscles can't contract, and our nerves can't fire, and that's, those are some really big problems. So, when calcium levels are too low in the blood, a gland, it's an endocrine gland called the parathyroid gland, is going to release a hormone called parathyroid hormone, PTH. The parathyroid gland is located in your neck. It's actually a series of little nodules that sit on top of your thyroid, hence parathyroid, which means around your thyroid. Your thyroid gland really sits around your um, throat and your larynx, okay, kind of on the, the lateral and anterior sides of, of, of your, your neck. So when calcium is low, this parathyroid gland will release parathyroid hormone. That's going to do a couple of different things. It's going to do three different things. Number one, it's going to tell the kidneys to reabsorb calcium from the urine. And, you know, that kind of makes sense because the last thing we need to do if calcium is low is to release it into our urine. So it tells the kidney tubules, the renal tubules, to reabsorb calcium. The second thing that it does is it stimulates the production of vitamin D. It does this because vitamin D is required for our digestive system to absorb calcium from our diet. So that's gonna also increase the amount of calcium by um, allowing us to absorb calcium from the foods that we eat. The third thing that it does is that it's gonna stimulate osteoclasts. So parathyroid hormone by stimulating osteoclasts, we'll remember that osteoclasts break down bone. So by stimulating these guys, it's gonna increase how much bone is broken down and all that calcium phosphate that's stored in bone tissues will then get released into the body fluids and that's going to increase the concentration of calcium. So when calcium's low in your body, you know, due to diet, let's say you just stopped eating calcium for, for whatever reason or due to some other, you know, deficiency, then um, your bones are going to be the ones that suffer. This is going to cause your bones to become less dense and um, it could increase the amount of fractures that can occur. I had even given you guys this example in class, but certain cultures where women, um, you know, they'll wear these, these, you know, these garbs or these robes that cover up their entire skin, only their eyes are exposed. They exhibit a very high occurrence of bone fractures. That's because they um, do not, uh, cannot absorb sunlight, which prevents them from um, 
producing vitamin D. If vitamin D isn't produced, then they can't absorb calcium from their diets, and that will cause the body to pull calcium from the bones, making the bones more brittle and less dense, which will lead to increased uh, frequency of fractures. So that's a little overview of just bone development and kind of how the body regulates calcium in the body. So thanks for listening.